Yes, I'm Joanna Nesseth. I'm Senior Vice President here, and I head up our work on food security. Um, I'm glad to have Mark Linus with us today. He's come over from the UK for some, some business and activities, and we're really pleased to have, be able to have a public discussion with him on biotechnology. I'm going to give one quick advertisement before we start. That is, this will probably be our last event on food security here at 1800 K Street. We've been living here for a couple of decades, and we're moving in September to 1616 Rhode Island Avenue. I have much uh, swankier digs there, so you won't have to sit in the basement for all of our discussion. So we'll look forward to seeing you there. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of context before we jump into our conversation. Uh, Mark is well known by now, I think, for um, talking about biotechnology and GMOs in very different ways. He started out as a very active opponent of biotechnology and GMOs. and. Um, famously in January, gave a talk and said, look, I've, I've kind of changed my mind. I've looked at the science of this issue, and I think that we need to re rethink the way we're talking about biotech, uh, especially from an environmental standpoint, but also from a humanitarian standpoint. We're pleased to have him here today because we've been doing work on food security for a number of years, and one of the areas we've been quite focused on is ag technology. Uh, over the past year, we've had a project underway looking at the potential for genetics and biotechnology to promote food security, especially among smallholder farmers. We've done field work in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda. We've looked at the science communities, the public research sector, the NGO and anti-GM activists, as well as um, sort of the, the communication structure around te this technology to see what, what does the regulatory structure look like? What does the communication structure look like? What is the real potential to actually improve food security with this technology? So we'll have a report coming out in October, and it's great to have a discussion today to talk about GM and biotechnology, but also really um, highlight its relevance for food security. So welcome, Mark. Thank you for Thank being you. with us. Um, I want to just start out and get some background. Um, I'd like to ask if you can kind of talk us through the path that you've taken. But what I'm really curious for you to talk about first is what was the genesis of opposition to biotechnology and GM technology? I think if you can talk to us about what was happening, this technology was what the first uh, crop or, or variety was introduced in, what, 1996? It's not that old. It hit at a time when there was a lot of movement, a lot of activity, and really caught a spark of opposition. And you were at the heart of that. Um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about what was the environment then and then how, how have things changed and progressed? How has your thinking changed? Um, and maybe just take us through that path. Right. Well, if I think back to, I think it was about 1995, 96, and there were several elements of how this debate um, unfolded which became almost like a perfect storm. And probably the first and the central aspect of this is that genetic modification was, appeared to be, and was doing something very new, um, and something where potentially humans were taking a technological step which shouldn't be taken, was somehow violating the species boundary, the, the order of nature itself, by transferring DNA between entirely unrelated organisms which couldn't breed naturally. And the archetype, of course, was the fish gene in the strawberry or whatever it was. Um, and if you just think of the imagery that that gives you immediately at a very visceral emotional level of, of outrage and disgust and so on and so forth and, and you don't, it doesn't take much to do a picture of a fish and a strawberry all joined together and to think that something pretty awful is happening there. And I actually think that was the main thing which really caught, caught the public mind was the way that that was presented and the way that that then um, gives you really a, a visceral response. And of course this feeds into a very deep-seated concern that we have in the modern world about how technology has, dri has driven too far. You can see this with the opposition to nuclear power and, uh, and the Franken stuff, you know, the Franken food, Franken fish, Franken trees. Um, that's a very clear association, of course, with the whole Frankenstein story where this monster is created out of stitched together body parts and is somehow imbued with this um, evil characteristic of the mad scientist having way too much power and therefore being punished for the hubris. And if this, it just goes back even further. It goes back to the Bible. You know, it goes back to the tree of knowledge, to the Tower of Babel. Every creation myth in the world has this element to it of somehow humans becoming too powerful. It's, it's one of our original angst. So I think this is a very, very deep-seated issue for a lot of people. And, and that resonance um, is really central to the opposition, combined with the 
concern about corporations mm -hmm. um, and about food supply and the concentration of corporate power within the food supply. Now, that's not all wrong. There are real issues there, I think. Um, uh, uh, and, and so that, that then became a major motiva motivating factor for the left and for the environmental movement generally. And all of these things combined with, um, certainly in Europe, with this American corporation, Monsanto, coming in and very arrogantly forcing this food into, into our food supply, forcing it down our throats. Again, you can think of the, the imagery that was employed there. Um, and it seemed also to be very tied up with the model of farming and agricultural production, which, which we were very much against, for, again, for some, for some good reasons, that this was chemical dependent monoculture, the whole package of uh, first generation herbicide tolerant crops, where you would, uh, you know, obviously p part of this is a misunderstanding. People, were, it's not as if everything was originally organic and then Monsanto comes in and suddenly it's all drenched with glyphosate. Of course, herbicides were already being used and there were already a lot of environmental concerns about the way that it was done. But there seems to be an, an ex a further extension of chemical um, type monoculture. So all of these elements combined to something which pushed all of the buttons of the environmental movement, but also made a very broad coalition. So we had Prince Charles, we had the Natural Law Party, we had the deep leftist Greens, uh, and, and sort of combined with the kind of the, the anxious foodie middle class to make this a very, very powerful thing, which is has not gone away. In fact, if anything, it's intensified over the last 10 or 15 years, despite being fundamentally based on several misunderstandings and misconceptions, and also flying in the face of, of what the mainstream scientific community would tell you. Can you talk a little bit about some of the key um, assumptions or beliefs that you have uh, looked through and decided you don't believe in or you don't agree with? Well, <laughs> It's been quite an epiphany to even get to grips with the basics of molecular biology. Mm -hmm. So I think I probably really did believe that there was such a thing as fishy DNA and strawberry oh. DNA, you, right? Uh, and I think most people would tell you the same. I think most people don't want, you know, you ask, ask someone on the street corner whether, whether they want genes in their pizza and they'll say, no, thank you very much. You know, I, don't want gene I don't want DNA in my food. That's a disgusting idea. So um, I, I actually, I, I was profoundly ignorant about this. I'm not... I'm, you know, I, I don't have a PhD now. I'm not saying I'm the best informed person in the world, but I have. This has been a very long learning process for me, and again, uh, this this came to me through trying to become a better science communicator myself. I was writing books primarily on climate change. I've written two or three books, one of which won the Royal Society Prize for Science Books, and so I was very enmeshed in the scientific community, uh, and in defending the scientific community from attacks from primarily from the political right, saying that climate change didn't exist. Um, so on and so forth, all of these kinds of associated conspiracy theories. And I would always say, look, you've got to focus on peer-reviewed science. You've got to listen to the scientific consensus on this issue. And at the same time, I was writing profoundly unscientific or even anti-scientific screeds about GMOs. And of course, that was an inconsistent position to hold, yet it's one that the environmental movement largely still holds today. And, and that inconsistency for me, I, I felt I could really only resolve it by being kind of pro-science without being overly simplistic, but to try and have a, a, a position which respected the clear scientific consensus on, on all of the different areas. It, it's, it's a really important set of conversations around how do you communicate science. Um, and I think in, in our research, we've looked at the fact that we need to bring more science to the passion and more passion to the science. Because on the scientific side, you get fairly dry communications of, but we've tried this, we've tested it, it works, it's fine. You don't understand. And on the, uh, the anti-GM side, you hear, but it's just not natural. I don't like it. It doesn't feel right. And you get these attempts kind of in the middle of people saying, well, I don't understand. People take medicine. That is biotechnology. Why is it a leap? to eat biotech food. And I always think in reaction to that comment, well, it's, it's different. You expect medicine to alter something in your person. You expect food to be nourishment and part of your family activity and part of a very you know, personal part of your life. It is very, very different. And I think that there has been um, a real challenge in bringing together a, a, a level of conversation and communication that addresses key scientific questions but also is recognizes some of the cultural impacts of food. Um, and if you look at some of the opposition to, to biotech, you've got the vi environmental opposition. And I think what the people who have come, come to talk more about biotech and GM technology 
uh, as part of a solution going forward tend to be environmental folks who say, look, this is important for managing um, a lower footprint for agriculture, for managing water flows, for using less pesticide. But then you've also got the health folks. And I think the health, that discussion about health and, and human health effects has been has really not taken off very well. So I'd like to have you just talk a little bit about science communication. How do you, how, and you said something earlier today, scientists have started in the UK to communicate from a public science standpoint. It's not, they're not speaking on behalf of industry. They're just saying, we're scientists, we're doing research, we see some public good to be done here. Can you talk more about science communication and where you see some potential productive discussions? Um, anyone who has any relationship with industry whatsoever, financial or professional, is, is compromised mm -hmm. in terms of how they can present themselves in this debate. Mm -hmm. And that's just a fact of life and you have mm -hmm. to deal with it. So the only people who can be seen to communicate honestly about this are the scientists who work in the public sector. Um, and luckily, um, given the need to change the debate here in a more rational direction, there are many public sector scientists who who are doing a lot of fascinating work. And one of the original ways I got into this was working with the scientists at Rothamsted Research mm -hmm. in the UK who are developing a GMO wheat which is um, designed to be resistant to aphids. Now aphids are not just an important insect pest, but they're also a vector for viruses. And so there's a lot of um, agrochemical use being used obviously to, to, to deal with that at the moment. So the situation as we have it now is that if we were able to deploy this, then we would be able to reduce the use of chemical pesticides. They also sidestepped some of the key arguments by saying this wasn't going to be patented, patented, sorry, since mm -hmm. we're in the US. Um, and therefore, you know, it, it, it wasn't going to be sort of another part of the corporate monopolization and so on and so forth. Um, but even though this was in the public sector, um, the activist said, this is helping Monsanto. You know, mm -hmm. They were clearly unable to make any distinction between private and public. It, there was just this mental imagery of, I, involved with GMOs, and, and it clearly it was not a very sophisticated approach. And the activists also constructed this image of, um, well, so, so the gene was a synthetic gene, but it, in the submission that the scientists made to the regulatory agency, they said it was clo more closely, closely related to one that was found in cows as well as one in, in mint and various other things. And so the activists then had a picture of a loaf of bread with horns and hooves and stuff like that. And so the, the imagery of this was something, again, something weird and unpleasant, you wouldn't want to eat it, you know, was very clearly communicated. And the activists also set a date for when they were going to destroy the crop. Um, so there was a very clear period of about two months where the scientists had to do something. And this forced their hand because mm -hmm. scientists, uh, you know, by, by disposition generally would like to stay in their labs. Um, don't really want, you know, they're autistic anyway, they don't want to like to speak to the general public. Um, and, but they had to, you know, and, and so I, I went in to try and help them just behind the scenes and, and, and said to them, you, you, you've got to win this battle in the public mind, otherwise you're wasting your time with your research. Um, not only will farmers never be able to use it, but it'll be destroyed next May, you know, well, in, in six weeks' time. So they, had, they, they did a YouTube video, which you can still see. They did a lot of um, media stuff. They took journalists around the site. Um, and, and they and frame the debate in the sense of don't destroy research. We need knowledge. You know, we, need ag we need innovation rather than are you pro or anti-GMO, which obviously is a, a, bit, a bit further for a step, a step for, for people to take. Um, and people were not in favor of destroying research. Um, and, and I think that came through very clearly from, from public opinion and from the media response. Um, were they then pro-GMO? Well, at least you could then begin to have a debate about the merits of this particular crop as opposed to this being about Monsanto or about all of the old style um, um, imagery which, which comes along with it. So uh, what, what I was, uh, you, you said at the beginning that scientists are, are dry. Scientists are not dry when they're speaking amongst themselves mm -hmm. and they've, they've had a few drinks. They get very right. passionate. Yeah. So you're suggesting we lube them up before yeah, they, they get Well, they get very passionate indeed. No, I'm yeah. suggesting that they yeah. say in public what they say what in they private. Say private yeah. um, then I think pe people would, yeah. would realize that these are real human beings who are passionate about their work because they're passionate about the environment and about food security. We found a, you know, a similar situation when we interviewed scientists um, in East Africa. I mean, first of all, they're kind of baffled that they're just scientists and they're working on stuff. How could that be perceived so badly? But also a real desire for the local scientific community to get credit for all the work that they're doing and, and for the country to be proud of their science, scientists. And um, I think it's a really important point you've made that if scientists get, ex even ag scientists who tend to be a low-key bunch, get pretty excited about what they're doing and why it's important, but they, they kind of stop when they realize there's a controversy and just say, I, I, just, I just don't get it. So pushing beyond that to, to explain things I think is really important. Um, 
I want to ask a little bit, you had said that in, in, environment and science were two reasons why you really started thinking differently about this, this topic, but you also said that you really looked at it from a humanitarian point of view. And, I, and we, you know, our primary focus is on food security and smallholder farmers. How do you think about it from that perspective, and what, what is your thinking on the humanitarian side? Well, um, fr from a humanitarian perspective, whether or not you as a smallholder farmer have a successful harvest or not is the key definer of whether your kids can go to school, whether they'll be malnourished, whether um, you can even see your kids survive the year. It depends on how much you can grow yourself. If this, we're talking about food security in, in rural areas across sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, wherever. Um, and I don't think people understand that because the talking points from, from the, from the anti-biotech side tend to be there's enough food out there, it just needs to be distributed properly. Uh, there's, some, there's some justice to some of those arguments, but they're very simplistic and very generalizing. And actually, what people can grow themselves is the key issue. Now, if you can help them be more resilient against droughts with um, more water-efficient crops, if you can help them be more resilient against pests and diseases with pest-resistant uh, crops, um, then it's got to be a crucial part. It's not going to be the be-all and the end-all because you're not helping them with corrupt officials, you're not helping them get access to capital, you're not dealing with poverty across the board. Um, you know, these are much wider development imperatives. But saying that people should not have access to these seeds and saying that farmers should, should be denied the choice of what to plant because of my, well, superstition, if you like, in a Western country where I'm well-fed, I think is a, is a very, very worrying and, and in many ways anti-humanitarian approach and I've been very critical of Greenpeace for its campaign against golden rice because mm -hmm. even if they say even even if it it wouldn't work um, it's worth a try given that um, what is it half a million children are dying each year from vitamin A deficiency um, because clearly what we're doing at the moment isn't solving the problem um, and for, for Greenpeace to say that that they already know it wouldn't work and therefore we shouldn't try it I think is a very very um, dangerous place to be and, and for them as a uh, I, I don't want to focus just on that single organization because there's lots of different organizations who have, have work in this area but uh, I, I think that would that will really will be a stain on the reputation of the whole environmental movement for decades unless that changes um, can, can you talk a little bit more I want to go back to uh, the science question and do you see um, do you see areas for dialogue and dispassionate discussion about this topic? Um, and, I, and I ask that sort of in the context of what we talked about earlier, which is that GM and biotechnology is but a sliver of what we need to focus on for food security. But it is a lightning rod sliver, but it is also uh, both a tool in the toolbox as well as sort of a gateway for other future technologies that you'd hope to see be able to progress. Um, what, what are some of the, the, the forums or the, the ways to maybe have a better dialogue in a more reasonable dialogue? Is that within the science community? Is that within governments? What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, it is very difficult because everyone has an opinion on this, mm -hmm. and a lot of people's opinions are based on misconceptions, even about how conventional crop breeding is done. You know, That's We could point. be having That's this whole point, debate yeah. about hybrids. chemical and radiation right. mutagenesis. Well, hybrids too. Mm -hmm. I don't think most people realize that, that F1 hybrids even exist. And so the idea was that, 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 that crops that don't uh, breed true were somehow an invention of, of, of Monsanto via GMOs. And actually, many of the GMO crops do breed true. So that's even a misconception <laughs> in and of itself. Uh, the fact that farmers have been, been growing hybrid corn since whenever it is, 1930, I don't think people realize. And so because this debate is based on misconceptions all the way across the board, it's very difficult to, to get to a place where you can actually reach any kind of rational, um, rational decision. So you, have to, you actually do have to tackle these at source and say, look, you're, you're wrong about this. And in all of these different areas, what you believe is actually the fundamental opposite of the truth. And um, that's one thing in the, in the kind of the popular mind, but for, for the environmental movement to be not just complicit, but actively promoting obvious untruths, I think is a very dangerous road to be, to be going down because it's, it, it, it claims to be, and largely is, evidence-based and science-based in many other areas. You know, I don't, I don't have, there's no disagreement between me and Greenpeace on the reality of climate change, between, uh, about the, the, the difficulties of biodiversity loss, of, of forest mm -hmm. um, devastation, things like that. So all of these different areas, we need to protect what the good that the environmental movement is doing by ensuring it doesn't do damage in some other key areas as well. <coughs> 
Let me, let me, let me uh, ask you a question about something that you have not mentioned yet, which is the Cartagena Protocol and what impact that's had on the debate and discussion and um, sort of national government decisions about how to proceed. Um, well, Calestus Juma gave a speech about this recently, and he was mm -hmm. the, um, the head of the um, Biodiversity Convention at the time, I mm -hmm. think, when this was framed. And I think he's, he's very critical of it in, in retrospect because it sort of throws in aspic the precautionary principle approach to this, which made a fundamental distinction between genetic modification and, and other forms of crop breeding, which is not real. I mean, if, if, you could, if you could breed two types of new corn, one done conventionally, one done with GM, but they were exactly the same in terms of their genomic structure. You could sequence the whole genome and the DNA is exactly the same. They would still be regulated differently um, across the whole world. Now, that is absurd. It's scientifically absurd. It's, it's logically absurd. Um, and uh, the fact that, that the protocol largely is, uh, is based on that misconception, I think, is a real problem. And it also, there's also a misunderstanding about biodiversity here. So people right. tend to think that somehow wild biodiversity is influenced by um, the biodiversity or the diversity, the genetic diversity of, of cultivated crops. They, these are two completely different things. In my, I mean, obviously, there's, there's important interactions, but they are completely different things. Yes, I think we should protect the diversity of, of cultivars as well for all sorts of reasons, but so does everybody else. We've got seed banks and, uh, and so on. And, and there's also another misunderstanding, which is that a GM corn is the same worldwide. Well, it's not. It's, it's the, the genes are bred into all of the different local varieties which are locally adapted. I mean, there's hundreds of different types of them. So again, we've got a, a debate here which is focused on and based on misconceptions which are so deep-seated mm -hmm. that it's very difficult to, 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 to move forward, I think, to have a rational outcome when you have debates based on, um, uh, uh, on misunderstandings. Well, that leads me to my next question, and I think this will be my last question, then we'll open up for uh, audience questions. Um, and I know you're not from the U.S., but I'm going to ask you to comment on what, what's happening here. We have, as you know, a really a rolling, ongoing, and accelerating debate around labeling and around uh, GM products in the U.S. and the U.S. food supply. And I'd like you just to kind of comment on it and sort of talk a little bit about where you see that going and what you, what you think are some, some challenges around that. Um, I mean, as a point of principle, I would agree with what the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences has said on this issue, which is that labeling is, 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 is not just unnecessary, but positively damaging mm -hmm. to, to public understanding of science in this area. Having said that, I don't think it's a winnable proposition to say to the to, to say to concerned consumers, food consumers, that they shouldn't have access to information that they say that they want. Um, so we've got a dilemma there of, about what to do on this issue. And I think the industry has to respond by being, uh, being creative and giving people the information that they say that, that, they, that they're after. You can't say, no, you, you, you are denied it. We're not going to tell you. We're not going to tell you what's in your food. Um, and I think the only way I can think of how this might, might be resolved is, is for, for non-GMO products to be clearly labeled and for that to be done voluntarily, but to be done across the board. And so if you as a shopper want to choose GMO-free uh, products in the same way that you might want to choose halal, if you're a, um, religiously inclined in that way, or anything else, organic, you know, then, then fine, you have the access to the information to do that. I think what's a real problem is to have mandatory labeling, which will then um, totally restructure the, the whole supply chain and will have knock-on effects which actually do affect food security in, in, in other parts of the world. So African governments are, are very concerned, for example, about their trade, agricultural trading relationships. That means that they have um, uh, GMO bans domestically, which are then preventing their own farmers from growing disease-resistant crops and so on and so forth. So what we, what we in the US do in terms of our own uh, perfectly well-fed consumers is, is, is going to have an effect on food security. And I think that, that whole aspect of this debate has not come through at all. Um, yeah, and I think there'll be a lot more to talk about in that front. And just so you all know, CSIS recently published uh, a fairly short paper called Trade and Tribulations, looking at um, some of the Im potential impacts of GM crops on trade flows from Africa, especially to Europe, and it really looks at the fact that most of the crops that are exported tend to be non-GM crops like coffee, tea, and cocoa, and most of the crops that would be grown as GM crops like corn or maize uh, would be traded domestically or even locally. So that <coughs> is on our website and it's public so you're all welcome to take a look at that. I want to open up to some audience questions. What I will try to do is take two to three at a time, kind of bundle them up to really put Mark on the spot here. 
Um, so if you will just raise your hand, and when you have a question, state your name, affiliation, and a brief question, uh, gentleman in the middle here. Uh, Pastor Britt Mitchell, I'm oh, sorry, thank you. Pastor Britt Mitchell uh, from the Renaissance Institute. Um, I had, do have a PhD, and I'm twice as ignorant as you, so it's <laughs> about this subject especially. What concerns me is I keep hearing news stories that the seeds, uh, the replicating mechanism in, in these kind of things aren't, isn't there. So people have to keep going back and buying fresh seed each year. Uh, and sometimes the seeds even cross lines to another farm and all of a sudden there's hassle. That's my question, I think, in the, in the seeding process. Uh, is that the way it is? And will people have to perpetually buy that kind of seed? Okay, thank you. And I saw another hand, uh, let's see, right here in the front. Hi, I'm uh, Paul Wagner of the CPA Express. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, or suggested that uh, scientific research that has been uh, funded uh, in part by the industry is uh, unfortunately tainted. Uh, uh, yet the, the FDA uh, doesn't require independent testing of uh, GMOs, uh, they instead re rely on their website that says that they encourage industry to, to consult with the FDA before doing their marketing. So there's not independent uh, research going on. That they, they don't require independent research to approve GMOs. Are you confident that GMOs, all GMOs are safe, or do you think there should be some sort of uh, independent testing okay, before, just, before they're released? Okay, we'll take those two questions because those are pretty big yeah, questions. Yeah, they are. Um, the, the first one, yes, you are completely wrong. Um, and this is one of the oldest myths in the, in the book is the idea that somehow GM, GMO crops are doing something new which is somehow tying farmers into an exploitative relationship with industry. This is one of the reasons why it became such a, a, a powerful um, idea in people's minds. Uh, the reality, as I mentioned before, is that when it comes to hybrid crops, that's already been the case for decades. Um, and, and corn is a very good, good example of that, but there's cotton, there's many other um, hybrid crops as well which, are, which don't breed true. So you can't save your seed from one year to the next I mean, you could do, but you'd get a much, uh, a much less high-yielding crop. Um, the second aspect of this myth is uh, it goes back to Terminator technology, um, which was proposed but never developed. The idea was actually to try and address the fears people had of contamination, um, but it became seen as, as this way where you'd have suicide seeds. You, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the terms which were coined were, again, very emotive and very powerful. Uh, where the seeds wouldn't, wouldn't survive from one generation to the next, and then farmers would have to go back and so on and so forth. Um, that never happened. So most of the GMO crops, you, could act, you can, and, and many farmers actually do save them from one year to the next. Um, and um, many of the proposals for, for, for food security-based uh, GM crops would have that aspect to them too. So golden rice, for example, the whole point of it is that where... Farm, farmers and where families are short of vitamin A and their kids' are, their health is suffering as a result, if they're growing that rice, then they could grow that year after year after year. That means somebody doesn't have to come and visit their village with vitamin A supplements. Um, it's something they can have themselves and which, is, um, w which really improves their, their resilience. So I, I think that there are, that's one of the most fundamental misconceptions about this whole technology is this idea. Um, you speak to farmers, actually, and yes, they have a technology agreement that they sign with Monsanto or whoever, um, and this applies to, 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 to the to, because this is a proprietary technology which is in the seed um, and so if they, if they want to grow the seed then they sign a, a technology agreement which means that they then can't save the seed and that's the basis of this, of this thing I think but you, no one's forcing you as a farmer to grow it you can grow organic seed, you can grow any seed you like there's hundreds of different types of varieties on there but the chances are you, if you want to grow the GMO one you want to do it because it gives you a better return This is also the basis of the recent Supreme Court decision Right. around uh, GM soybeans where a farmer <coughs> saved for several seasons uh, his crop and then planted them and was uh, taken to the Supreme Court and actually lost his case because he had deliberately uh, he violated... Well, he didn't. Uh, he, he got right? the crops from... He got the, the, the seeds from an elevator. He mm -hmm. grew the ones out, sprayed them with, with, with Roundup mm -hmm. and found the ones which were, yeah. which were Roundup ready. So they had that trait. Then he grew those. Mm -hmm. So what he was trying to do was to use Monsanto's technology without paying Monsanto. It was, it was classic piracy. And the issue was at the Supreme Court, whether or not um, the p patenting covered self-replicating technology, which is different from digital technology. I, as a, as a writer, don't want people to copy my books digitally, for, for, you know, because then that deprives me of a royalty. So, but my books don't replicate themselves in the same way as a seed does. So this, is a, this was a, 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 an important legal precedent, which is why the Supreme Court wanted to consider it. 
which I got teased about at home for finding fascinating. My husband kept saying, whoa, well, <laughs> update me on that case. Um, OK, and then the, next, the second question we had about the FDA. Oh, um, well, it's different in different places. I mean, the FDA, uh, the FDA doesn't, doesn't require testing. Uh, it doesn't require independent testing, but everyone does it anyway. So it's a bit like, I mean, every other area, if you make a car, uh, as a manufacturer, you're responsible for ensuring that car is safe, or a washing machine, or pretty much ev everything else you can think of. We don't have whole, whole, whole government agencies which, which independently test cars. And so the manufacturer is responsible for ensuring the safety of their product. That then, that's then double-checked by the, by the FDA or by the USDA or whoever. You can probably, there's probably people here who can explain to me the US regulatory system much, much better than I can. In, in Europe, um, there is independent testing uh, which has been funded by the European Union. And there are really, there have been hundreds of different studies. Some of them animal, animal test studies and so on and so forth. There's a whole database of these you can find online. So it is a myth that there's been no independent testing. Am I concerned about the safety aspect of GMOs? No, I'm not in the slightest extent. Um, for anything which is currently on the market. Um, you, you, you know, we know what the genes are, we know what the proteins are they encode for, we know whether they're allergenic or in any way potentially harmful. Um, I would probably be more concerned about um, uh, mutagenic um, conventional breeding and things which are affecting the genomes of crops without any knowledge of what the impact of that's going to be in the resulting, uh, the resulting food stuff. And those can be released in the public. In fact, they can even be called organic. So I think, again, there are, there are misnomers here. I don't actually think that, that there should be this very heavy regulatory burden placed on GM, which isn't placed on, uh, on, on other types of crop breeding at all. So you know, we need, we need a, a, a more rational evidence-based um, discussion about this, where what's in the genome of the crop is the important thing, not how you got there. It's the outcome, not the process, which needs to be regulated. OK, next round of questions. Let's see. We'll take gentleman here, and then man in the green shirt, <coughs> and then over here. My name is uh, Luis Kuhn. I'm a professor of uh, national security at uh, National Defense University. I'm a biomedical engineer. Um, wh when I look at the, at the data, uh, it is difficult for me, uh, and, I, and I have to give you an example. Uh, today, if, if you talk about electronic health records, they do not contain genetic information. They do not contain, for example, your vaccine registry. So it's very difficult to look at long-term effects of those vaccines when you combine them with the genes. Um, if you look at uh, human life in general, after your 65th birthday, you start accumulating many, many chronic conditions that develop. And, and therefore, the, the long-term effects of GMOs, uh, to me, are uh, completely unreliable. The, the data that is being discussed is unreliable because you, you are not testing. It's almost like saying you, you give a vaccine today and if you don't have a rush within a week, you're okay. You, you have no idea in the long term what are the effects of that. So I will contend that, that that's the issue that I would like you to address. Okay, we'll address that. And the gentleman in the uh, green shirt. Thank you. I'd like you to compare yourself. Could you just and, introduce yourself? Oh, Gerald Chandler. Um, no organization. I'd like you to compare how you uh, changed your point of view to what it might take to uh, change the point of view of Gilles uh, Saralini. For the rest of the audience, Gilles Saralini, about a year ago, published a paper which purported to show that uh, rats eating uh, GM corn had more cancer, and subsequently most of the scientific community has said it was bad research. So my question is, basically, you went through a process of deciding that uh, you hadn't looked at the science close enough. Here's a scientist who says he has, and he has opposite point of view of you. So what good, would it good take him? Good question to talk about the Seralini study, yes. And then we had a gentleman over here. Yes, I want to get back to your Could point. Could you just about, introduce yourself? Uh, Mike Snow, journalist. I wanted to get back to your uh, point at the introduction on pushing buttons. You, you tended to- Can you hold the microphone? You tended to portray uh, people that were had questions about GMOs in a kind of stereotypical frankincense. But there are many uh, scientists, many reputable scientists, who have voiced concerns about GMOs, have voiced concerns about health issues pertaining to GMOs, like Dr. Arpad Pushta, in, in, uh, at, who was, spent 35 years at the Rowett Institute, and was fired. Uh, but there are many other scientists like him, like Seralini, uh, like Shiv Chopra in Canada, 
who was offered a million to two million dollar bribe by Monsanto to rubber stamp and fast track RBG milk into the system. They don't have it there. We have it here. It's the only place in the world where we have it. Um, okay, I think we're, let's one more question. question real quick. And there are many scientists that also question your own credentials as this recent convert to pro-GMO because you've, I, I know you've written extensively for the New Statesman and uh, the okay, Guardian. Get, get, we need to but how many of those were about GMOs? Okay. So we have a host of questions about sort of the science establishment and scientific decision then. Um, gentlemen there mentioned vaccines. We don't know the long-term effects. Well, we do know the long-term effects. The long-term effects are that you're protected against diseases, which would otherwise um, do you substantial harm. Um, vaccines have, have saved billions of lives since, since their invention. Um, and I, I just can't see any arguments which make any plausible sense. I could draw you, and you're, I think you're conf confusing um, causation and correlation. I could draw you a very clear cor correlative graph between the rise of organic food sales and the rise of autism and other chronic diseases across societies, whether it's in the US and, or, or, or anywhere else. Would I su suggest there's any causation, causative relationship there? I would not. And I think the same would go for, for GMOs. Um, the test, it, it's just, it's scientifically completely implausible that there is any relationship. There's nothing new in this food which could plausibly be having any of the health effects which are, which are, which are suggested. And the same goes for vaccines and autism. Um, and this pertains to the gentleman's point there. No, I'm not an expert in this. I'm not a bio, biochemist. I'm not a trained molecular biologist. So the best I can do, and this is the same for my attitude to the climate change debate, where I'm not a climatologist either. The best I can do is to say that 97, 98% of the, of, the, of the scientists out there who are experts on this and who are actively researching in this field have come to a very clear conclusion. That conclusion is, is very clearly advocated by the Royal Society, by the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, read their consensus statement, which was published about uh, six months ago on labeling. They say there is, there, is, there is no basis for concern. I can't remember the exact form of words, but there's no basis for concern about any differences between GMO crops and uh, conventionally bred foods. So if that's what the scientists are saying, and you claim to be evidence-based, and you claim to be a science-based organization or, 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 or thinker, then I think you need to have respect for that. You, you're welcome as an individual to make up your own mind about every issue in a democratic society. But given that those of us who are lay people need to at some point figure out who to trust, we can't go to the basis of all of the research in every single area, then we need to ultimately respect the, the views of the authoritative academic institutions on this. And this pertains to Seralini. Um, he, he is an anti-GMO activist who also happens to be a professor who at the same time as publishing this research was selling a, a book called um, GMOs are, are Evil and Dangerous or whatever it was called. This was in French, so I can't remember the translation. Um, <clears throat> That study was universally panned by every single academic institution across Europe and, and across the world for the simple fact that it was utterly flawed. Um, they took a type of rat which is predisposed to getting cancer if you let it live long enough, let it live long enough, and then found out, lo and behold, they all had tumors. And most of the controls, and they had a very small number of controls to ensure there was no statistical significance to their results, also had tumors. They didn't show pictures of the control rats who hadn't been fed GMOs with massive um, tumors sprouting out of their bodies because that wouldn't have gone, so well, gone down so well in the media. So this was straightforward propaganda and pseudoscience, which is uh, very unfortunate. But again, this is why uh, the internet, you could see all this stuff proliferating. There was a lot of very striking pictures from these kinds of things. We have to do better than that. As, environmentalists, as, as an environmentalist myself, I have to do better than that. I cannot take a single marginal pseudoscientific viewpoint and say that this is, this is the, the, the be all and the end all. I have to respect the scientific consensus across this area. Just to that point, um, what do you think are, for example, the best websites to look at to find basic scientific information. Is it AAAS? Are there other organizations? Well, I mean, the AAAS statement is just one page long yeah. as a PDF. There were some references in that. Um, the, th there's been whole reviews now as well. I would also recommend people go to biofortified.org, mm -hmm. um, which has, has a an online database of the literally hundreds of peer-reviewed um, safety studies which have been done on GM crops. Um, and and it actually aggregates those which are industry-funded and those which are independent as well, if you're concerned about that too. That's great, great. Okay, other questions. Hopefully we'll have some in the back of the room. Okay, gentleman in the blue shirt, uh, woman in the green shirt, and then uh, we'll go to you in the middle with the purple shirt. A very oh. colorful crowd. Well, thank you very much. Brian Greenberg with Interaction. I wondered if you might comment, excuse me, <coughs> on the fact that the production of GM crops is not simply about the seeds that they take 
that they occur in a farming system, which is largely a green revolution model with all of the high external inputs, and particularly from your environmental perspective, uses a great deal of fertilizers, which especially in the case of nitrogen fertilizers contribute significantly to uh, greenhouse gases. And secondly, that their use takes place in an economic system which generally doesn't favor the smallest holders. The adopters tend to be larger commercial farmers and tend not to be the poorest small holders and almost exclusively not the kind of subsistence producers that you referred to in justifying uh, their use as a food security mechanism. Okay, thank you. great, thank you. Um, into the back here. Hey, Kelly Witkowski with the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture. Uh, for me, one of the important parts of this GMO debate is the presence of adequate biosafety bio regulatory frameworks, and I was wondering if you could please comment a little bit on that. And you know, I know that uh, many of the developing countries don't necessarily have the capacity yet to develop these by themselves, and you know, whether you think that the private sector should play a role in helping these countries, making sure that those <coughs> are established. Okay, great. And then a uh, gentleman in the middle with, okay, where's our microphone? Can you just stand up and they'll spot you here? You're hard to miss. I'm easy to spot. Um, I wanted to ask. Can you introduce uh, yourself? Please? Oh, my name is Hayden Gowdy. I'm with the GIC group. Um, and I was, uh, I, I wanted to ask you about labeling again. Um, I was wondering if you could clarify about the costs and consequences of labeling. Uh, I believe there's a recent initiative in Washington State that's up for uh, that's up for the ballot this uh, fall. Um, just wondering if you could clarify the costs, uh, what would the consequences would be for ag firms, as well as you mentioned um, an alternative system labeling non-GMO foods. And um, I know terms like organic are heavily regulated, whereas terms like natural are not. So I was wondering if you could uh, clarify, would that be a regulatory system? Would that be something that's regulated? Or would that be dependent on firms just volunteering? OK, great. So questions about sort of smallholder farms in developing countries as well as labeling. Um, gentlemen, that began by talking about the Green Revolution. I would defend that from a food security perspective. Um, Norman Borlaug, who of course was an American agronomist who died not so long ago, won the Nobel Peace Prize in, when was it, 1970? On the basis of having saved a billion lives through the Green Revolution. He and his colleagues turned India from a chronically impoverished, famine-stricken country into a food exporter within about 10, 15 years. The same went for Pakistan, Mexico, and much of the developing world, with the exception of sub-Saharan Africa, which is still a major concern. Um, Yes, that was done with, with higher yielding seeds, but that was a good thing. Yes, that was done with more inputs, um, I I irrigation and also nitrogen fertilizers, but you can't grow a crop without having a fertilizer there in order to provide the nutrients the crop needs. And the, in, in, in nutrient deficient soils, that was an important <coughs> thing to do. Now, there are disbenefits to the large scale human alteration of the nitrogen cycle. I read a whole chapter on this in, in, my, in my latest book. Um, and not least of which are nitrogen runoff, eutrophication in river systems, dead zones in places like the Gulf of Mexico. So I think this is an important area that agriculture needs to address, and I think most farmers would agree with that. Um, biotechnology can potentially help, um, as can conventional crop breeding, by having more nitrogen use efficient crops, uh, which need less fertilizer or use what is there more effectively. Um, in the, the long term, the kind of holy grail is to get leguminous staple food crops. Um, which fix their own nitrogen and don't then need any kind of external input. And I think the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and other agencies have, have actually funded a multi-million dollar effort, partly which is partly uh, led by UK scientists, to try and see whether this is even possible. I mean, it's, it's a long shot because the process of nitrogen fixation is a very uh, complicated one. Uh, it's not a case of inserting a bunch of genes and, and waiting for it to happen. So whether it's even possible, we don't know. But I think there's many ways in which um, biotechnology can potentially help deal with the nitrogen overuse problem. Um, you said about larger commercial farmers. Well, I think actually it's, it's now the case that most GM crops, are, in terms of the numbers of farmers cultivating them, are now in the developing world. Um, it's also the case that for BT cotton, for example, in India, that's not necessarily just the big guys. Um, and there's been several social science studies which have shown that 
a, a lot of uh, th there have been major monetary benefits to farmers for growing these co these new cotton seeds. That's why they do it. By the way, they don't do it because they're being tricked every single year by these companies. They do it because they understand their own self-interest and they have a better return. They get a better crop and they don't have to put insecticide on it to nearly the same extent. So there's biodiversity benefits to this too. There was a study in China recently which showed that there was a big proliferation in non-target insects and birds and bees and all the rest of it because these crops were not being sprayed with insecticide. Um, so this is a, a huge benefit here in terms of the um, agrochemical sector being, uh, which actually affects their products. You know, I want to see GM crops which, which get rid of agrochemicals. So this idea that somehow they're part and parcel of the same package for next generation biotech, I think is a, doesn't, should, doesn't have to be and shouldn't be the case. Um, lady over there spoke about biosafety in developing countries. I, I think the, my primary concern on biosafety as, a, as an environmentalist is, in, is invasive species and invasive pathogens in particular, which have nothing to do with biotechnology and which I think are, are, are very much insufficiently regulated. We are about to lose all of our ash trees in, in the UK because of a new pathogen, fungal pathogen, which has come in. And we've already lost the elm trees. You have, of course, the was the American chestnut. Um, we lost all of our. You lost all of those too. I mean, yeah. this, none of this has to do with biotechnology. This has to do with biosafety, and that, for me, is, is where the main area of concern is on this. And I think that it is improperly regulated. I don't think GMOs need special biosafety protocols and regulation in every single country. Um, that's a, a way to, to basically freeze up the sector, which is, I think, one of the reasons why it's been proposed and is so heavily focused on by people who are against the technology in principle. Um, but yes, you need some. You need you need food safety regulation. Um, but whether every single sub-Saharan African country can afford and should 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 do its own uh, own one, I don't know. It might make sense to try and have a a continent-wide approach where there is a pooling of resources between um, lots of small countries with very, uh, themselves very inefficient resources. Um, on the, and just to finish up on the labeling issue, I don't know how you'd run it. Um, the, the organic sector is in, in, in Europe is self-policing. There are several different organic certification um, um, companies, in fact. Um, but you do need to have consumer trust for whatever that is on the label. People need to know that it's real and it's not just natural. As you said, it's not just something which any company can make up. But um, I think food products which don't have any GMO in them, and that's actually not very many because cheese would do, beer would do, um, anything with any kind of corn der derivatives would do, so that's most sweetened drinks and pretty much everything else. So you, it wouldn't actually be too much trouble to label those which are GMO free, um, either microorganisms or throughout the agricultural production chain. Uh, and so that's why I think that's the key thing. If you as a shopper want to buy GMO, entirely GMO-free things, then, then you should be able to do that. But the cost of that, and there would be some incremental cost, should be borne as you, uh, you know, because that's your choice. And you want, to, you, you want to exercise that choice, fine, you have to pay a bit more, as you do with organic. Um, and I think that's the right way to do it, as opposed to mandating uh, labeling across the entire um, sector, which would be very difficult to do and would probably cost quite a lot of money. I don't know how much it would be. I don't think it's, impo I don't think it's possible to even imagine how you'd quantify it because it depends on the, on the choices of, of billions of people um, across not just... This is a globalized food system we have here. It's, it's not just choices that consumers make in, in America do affect people in, in other parts of the world as well because of these supply chains and these trading systems. And just the overall perception of what America does has ripple effects, just like what Europe does has ripple effects. Yeah, and, and in Europe, ha effectively has has bans on on GMOs. Um, it's not; they're not legal. I mean, they are. There are legal bans in some countries which are illegal in European law. So the whole the whole thing is a complete mess. Also, I mean, Italy just introduced a ban on GMO corn, um, which it can't justify scientifically because there's no scientific basis to it. Um, so that is also illegal under European law. So the European system is completely broken. And, uh, and the UK environment minister recently made a speech essentially saying they were going to pull out of Europe because the, the whole sector of biological research is being frozen out for, 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 from an entire continent here. So we're being left with a, a food sector which is basically turning into a museum um, because we can't do agricultural innovation because of, of, of certain preoccupations of certain people within certain countries. Well, I think we've just about hit uh, the hour mark here. 11 o'clock is when we promised to stop. But I wanted to give you the opportunity. Are there any, is there anything we haven't <coughs> talked about that you wanted to touch on or any closing comments you'd like to make? I just think we have to be very specific about this. I was at the um, Donald Danforth Plant Science Center recently, and I got to hold one of their GMO cassava plants, mm -hmm. which is in a pot at the moment, yep. along with various other ones. Um, cassava is a very important staple food. 
um, for, for many different countries in sub-Saharan Africa. It's being affected by a viral disease called brown streak virus, which just mm -hmm. trashes the tuber. I mean, you can't, you can't eat it. It just, it just destroys the whole thing. Um, there's no way, unfortunately, for this to be dealt with by conventional breeding. So for me, the important issue here is about the choice of farmers in developing countries. Should they be, uh, given the choice of whether to plant a virus-resistant version which is going to actually be able to feed their families when this virus does strike, I think they should have that choice. At the moment, the anti-biotech lobby is saying that that choice should be denied and there should be a ban implemented across every country, across the whole world on this entire technology. And I don't think that's a supportable position and I don't think it's an environmental position. Well, thank you. And I should mention, you don't just cover biotech. You have just released an e-reader, Nuclear Power, which is available <laughs> no, for about $3. I know, isn't that ridiculous? I just try and upset everyone. But yeah, yeah. yeah it's a but <laughs> that's, I think you can find it through your website? Um, it's on Amazon. Or it's on Amazon. So you can take a look at that if you're interested in nuclear power. We also have a, a new, um, we actually have a new report at CSIS on the future of the nuclear power industry in the U.S. Just to, you know, diversify our topics really widely. Um, but thank you for taking the time to come here. I think there's been a lot of interest in sort of hearing from you here in the U.S. We appreciate your time. Thank you all for joining us. And please join me in thanking Mark.